I've been talking about how the, the Word of God is an incorruptible seed and that the whole kingdom of God operates off of the Word of God, off of these truths. It's like a seed. In the same way that you can't have a plant, you can't have a harvest, you can't have a person without planting a seed. You can't have a miracle from God without planting a seed with, with this one exception. And I'm not to say this quickly and go on because I don't want to stop here. But if the only way you could receive from God is to plant a seed and give it time and harvest it, then people who come forward tonight and are just now hearing the truth and yet they only have a week to live, they'd just be destined to die because they don't have the time to let the seed work. So to deal with that, God has given us the ability to pray with someone and agree and mix our faith and help them before their seed has produced the harvest. And there's also people that have the gifts of healing and the gift of miracles that you can draw off of those gifts. And I believe that those are temporary to help you until you learn how the kingdom works and you begin to start sowing the seed and walking in the harvest. But the problem in the body of Christ is that they don't know how to plant the seed and stand on the word and receive it for themselves. We have become dependent upon the pastor of the church, upon a full-time minister, upon somebody with the gift of healing to come along and do it. And even though God does minister that way, that was not intended to be the normal way for you to receive. God wants you to be able to just take the truth and sow it in your heart and see the harvest. And it actually is wrong when you become dependent upon somebody else to receive your miracle from God. But because of his great love, he has made this other way to receive. But, and we're going to pray with people tonight. We want to help you. If you are struggling, praise God, we want to help you. But we also want to encourage you to, you know, I'm trying to work myself out of a job. Amen. I'm trying to get to where you don't depend upon me and you don't have to come and wait for somebody who's anointed to lay hands on you. Man, I don't have anything that you don't have. The only thing is I've, I've let the word take root and maybe I've got some fruit growing and I can help you along the way. But man, we need to quit uh, depending upon other people and we need to get to where we take the truth of God's word. So anyway, we've been talking about this. I've done the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And tonight I just want to show you what Jesus thinks of the word. Of course, Jesus is the word, John chapter 1 but I'm going to show you how he referred people to the word and how important the word of God was to Jesus. And of course, he's our example and we should be emulating him. So in Luke chapter seven, let's turn over here and look at this. In Luke chapter seven is where Jesus had just raised the widow's son from the dead in the city of Nain. It was a great miracle. I mean, this boy was dead. He was already in a casket. They were carrying him to bury him and he stopped the funeral procession and raised this boy from the dead. And look at this in Luke chapter seven and in verse 18, and the disciples of John showed him all of all these things. What things? The boy being raised from the dead, the miracles that Jesus had done. And in verse 19, and John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, art thou he that should come or look we for another? And you know, it's easy to skip over this, but I just want to amplify this a little bit. I could spend a lot of time on this, but I don't think we realize what a crisis this was for John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the only person in history that was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. You can read that in Luke chapter one. He leapt in his mother's womb and was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was a prophecy. He was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. He was separated unto God his entire life. He didn't grow up normal. He didn't have a girlfriend. He didn't go to school. He didn't have a normal childhood. It, the Bible says he was in the deserts until the day of his appearing. And most people believe that he was raised by this group called the Essens, the people that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and lived down there around there. And they were a very strict religious order. And I mean, 
John the Baptist was separated unto God from his mother's womb, and he was just separated unto God. And now, here he is. He'd been in prison an undisclosed period of time, at least six months, maybe a year or more. And here's this guy who was so powerful that he came and started preaching, and within six months, think about this, within six months, this man had turned the nation of Israel to God. And not only Israel, but all of the surrounding nations. And thousands and thousands of people were coming to be baptized. He prepared the way for the Lord. This is probably the greatest example of revival that has ever happened in the world. John the Baptist was on fire and just doing awesome things. And then he got put in prison. And for a guy who had this zeal to go out and preach and tell people about the Messiah coming, to put him in prison and muzzle this guy to where he didn't have a voice. Man, that's worse than torture. That's terrible torture, not to be able to fulfill and to speak what God put in your heart. Man, if somebody shut me up and I had nobody to talk to about the Lord, I don't know that I'd want to live. It's what my whole life's about. And I believe John the Baptist was awesome. So anyway, this guy was in a crisis situation and he was doubting that Jesus was the Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said, ask Jesus, is he the one that's coming or do we look for another? And all I can do is speculate why he thought that, but I know that Jesus' own disciples and most people of the day, they interpreted the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus' first and second coming, it all ran together and they saw him coming and establishing a physical kingdom here on this earth. And when Jesus wasn't establishing a physical kingdom. He was just ministering to people spiritually and he wasn't trying to overthrow the Roman government. There's a lot of people that begin to wonder if he was the Christ because they expected it to not only have a spiritual impact, but a physical impact. So I think some of it came from false expectations. But whatever it was, John was doubting that Jesus was the Christ. And when you take into account that this was his whole life's work, he had been given a sign that upon the one upon whom you see the Holy Spirit descending and remaining upon him, he is the one. At one time, John was so confident that Jesus was the Christ that he actually sent his disciples after Jesus. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. At one time, he was totally convinced that Jesus was the Christ. And he was willing to send his disciples. And when the Pharisees came out and tried to play on his ego and say, have you heard that Jesus is baptizing more disciples than you? He's draw, drawing bigger crowds than you did. What they were trying to do was to separate John and Jesus and get them fighting amongst themselves. They were trying to play on his ego. But he was so convinced that Jesus was the Christ that he said, I'm not even worthy to bend over and undo the latch on his uh, sandals. says he must increase, but I must decrease. This man who at one time was so convinced that Jesus was the Christ that he was willing to forsake his own ministry, lay his own life down and everything. Now he was doubting that Jesus was the Christ. Are you the Christ or do we look for another? Man, this is a serious situation. And look at Jesus' response. It says in verse 20, when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. The way this is stated, Jesus didn't even answer John's disciples immediately. He just went about doing things, opening blind eyes, casting out devils, opening up deaf ears. And he did all of these things in, in one hour's time. And then uh, in verse 22, it says, Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard and how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf ear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You know, when I read this, for years I read this, and I thought, what kind of answer was that? Here's somebody who 
without John, Jesus would have had to have drawn the crowds on his own. But he, John had already drawn the crowds and then sent all of the crowds after Jesus. The Old Testament scripture, Malachi says that he prepared the way lest God would come and smite the earth with a curse. That implies that if John hadn't have done his job instead of Jesus coming and bringing good news, he might have smitten the earth with a curse. John prepared the way. God, John made people receptive. Jesus benefited from what John had done. And here's John now in trouble and needing help. And how did Jesus respond to him? He ignored him for an hour, did miracles and says, go tell John what he's seen and heard and he'll be blessed if he's not offended in me. Man, that didn't seem like a really good answer to me for a long, long time. And then look at this in verse 24. It says, and when the messengers of John were departed, in other words, they were gone. They were out of earshot. They couldn't hear this. Here's what he began to say. He began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went you out into the wilderness for to see a reed shaken with the wind? Of course, that's sarcasm. They didn't go out there to see the reeds blowing in the wind. The reeds had been blowing in the wind for centuries and they didn't send thousands of people out there. It wasn't the scenery that drew them out into the desert. In verse 25, but what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's houses. In other words, it wasn't John's fancy clothes that drew all of the crowd. John wore camel's hair. Man, I, I remember when the hippie movement was going and I was in Vietnam and they sent me the Jesus People magazine and of course they were, you know, in rebelling and everything and rebelling at the standards of dress and they were into all this stuff. And anyway, they used this example and they talked about camel hair and how, how much it stunk and how it was such a poor clothing and everything like this. And they said the only thing that stunk more than camel's hair was wet camel's hair. And John spent most of his time in the water baptizing people. And they described him as this smelly person who had a long beard and honey and a locust leg stuck in it and stuff. You know what? John was not a fashion statement. It wasn't his patent leather shoes and fancy clothes, three-piece suit that drew people out into the desert is what Jesus is saying. But what, you out, what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. This is a quotation from Malachi chapter 3. You know what Jesus is doing? Jesus was the most influential man in the nation. The people were coming to him by the tens of thousands. And here is the most powerful man of his day saying, John is the prophet that was prophesied in Malachi chapter 3. This is a fulfillment of scripture that had been prophesied for 400 years. What an awesome thing to say about somebody. Why did he wait until John's messengers were gone? Why didn't he tell them that? See, this is the way I thought. I was reading this. And then he goes on to say, and he says, For I say unto you, among them that are born of women, which includes just about everybody, <laughs> there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow. You know, if I was discouraged and I was looking for something to encourage me, man, what would it be like if you just pick whoever you think is the most powerful, influential person on the planet today, if they were to call me out in front of everybody and start saying these kind of things about me, wouldn't that build your ego a little bit? Don't you think that'd help you a little bit? I wondered, why didn't he say this when, to John's disciples? Why did he just heal some people and say, go tell John what you've seen and heard? You know, Pastor Bob here has been a great friend of mine. It's a, it's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing, but my mother actually got us together. My mother wanted me to meet Pastor Bob Nichols, and she prayed for a long time. And then there was this man, Elmer Hannibut, who was a um, neighbor of Bob Nichols, who he became a partner of mine, and I got to know Elmer, and Elmer was always trying to get Bob and me together. 
And I wasn't going to impose on Bob and, and force my way on him. And so anyway, it wasn't happening. So what Elmer did was invite Bob and Joy over to his house for a meal and invited Jamie and me and didn't tell any of us that the other one was going to be there. <laughs> and so he kind of threw us together and, and it was obvious what he was doing. And in my way of thinking, I was taking advantage of a friendship and stuff. And I felt really bad about it. And I was embarrassed and Bob was just as gracious as he could be. He was nice and he was friendly to me. But anyway, that was the first time I met Pastor Bob was over at Elmer Hannibut's house. And it, in my estimation, it was a negative thing. And then it was either two or three years later when we were pastoring in Seagoville, Texas. And I mean, people stayed away from my meetings by the thousands. <laughs> I mean, there was tens of thousands that stayed away. I just went over there this week and saw the little place where we met and we never had a crowd of more than 12 people in two years. And five of those were on staff. <laughs> it was bad. And anyway, I came over to Calvary Cathedral when it was downtown. And I was in this 2,000 seat auditorium. And uh, if you remember their old facility there in the center, I, I mean, there was a, there, how many were in a row? Probably 20 or 30 or something like that. There was a lot. There wasn't a center aisle like this and it was just a, a big deal. And there was 2,000 people. I was in the middle of the auditorium, in the middle of the aisle, I was like 15 or 20 people in from the aisle. And uh, they were having an ICFM conference. So I came over for that. And I remember Hagen and Copeland and everybody prophesying to each other. And they were all ministering to each other. And I was sitting back there feeling like nothing. And I thought, God, they're all prophesying to each other. I need a prophecy. Why don't they minister to some of us? And anyway, I was feeling totally neglected and feeling, I was just, you know, like, man, what's the use? I might as well quit. And when they said, go greet somebody, I remember Pastor Bob jumped off of the platform. He was up there at the platform, rammed down the aisle, pushed his way through 15 or 20 people and just started hugging me. And he says, don't quit. Don't quit. Hallelujah. And I mean, he didn't just give me a hug and say, don't quit. Everybody in the place was sitting. And here was the <laughs> pastor and me standing with him hugging me and saying, don't quit, don't quit. Hallelujah. And you know what? I thought, man, God does know I exist. <laughs> God sent Pastor Bob to give me a hug. And you know what? It helped me. And I'm not denying that we are emotional people and that every once in a while we need a hug. Matter of fact, I was with Bridget Hawks. I don't know if she's here tonight, but anyway, Bridget was telling me that you need 16 hugs a day. <laughs> and uh, uh, Joe, the guy that was with us, he's a big guy. He says, I need more than 16. I'm a big guy. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not denying that we are emotional and that we need things and feel things, but why didn't Jesus say these complimentary things and build John the Baptist up. Why did he say, just go tell him what you've seen in her and he'll be blessed if he's not offended. And I mused over this for years. And then look at this over in Isaiah chapter 35. One day I was just reading. I wasn't even thinking about John the Baptist in that passage of scripture, but I was reading in Isaiah chapter 35. And if I had time, I could prove to you that this is all about the Messiah. It's all prophetic and it's telling you what will happen. Matter of fact, John the Baptist quoted from these verses. And in his day, the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse. It was in scrolls and they had the book of Isaiah. So for him to quote from these passages of scripture and say, this is, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. That means that he knew these passages of scripture. This is what God used to confirm to him and to tell him what his mission was. And it's what God spoke to him about what the Messiah would do. So I was reading here in Isaiah chapter 35 and in verse three, this is a scripture that was written to John the Baptist telling him what to do. And in verse three, it says, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. 
And then it tells you what will happen when the Messiah comes. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And when I read this, all of a sudden the Lord just spoke to me and he says, you know what Jesus did? Jesus fulfilled Isaiah chapter 35, the prophecies. He didn't just say to John, John, you're a great guy. You're the greatest man that's ever been born. You are the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. He didn't say things that just made him feel good. He fulfilled the word and then he told his disciples, you go tell John what you've seen and heard and blessed is he if he won't be offended. You know what I believe Jesus was doing? Jesus honored John so much. He said himself that this is the greatest man that has ever been born on the planet. Jesus honored John. It's because he honored him that he didn't just give him a hug. Again, I'm not saying we don't show uh, respect and honor and stuff, but Jesus gave John his greatest way of encouragement, and that was the Word of God. He fulfilled the word of God. He pointed him back to the word. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when we get discouraged, most of us just want an emotional thing. Will somebody come hug me? What you need is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If Jesus would have said something complimentary about John, it might have helped John that day. But when he woke up the next day and he was still in prison and they came to behead him, and stuff like that. Those little feelings and stuff don't go very far. But man, when you are basing your life on the Word of God, that is what gives you stability. That's what faith comes from. And you know what? John needed something more than just an emotional connection. Jesus, in a sense, acted like he really didn't care that much. Our touchy-feely world today would criticize Jesus. If somebody came forward tonight who was just crying and hurting. Let's you know, just say, Pastor Bob, man, we've had this relationship for a long time. He's done so much for me. And if Pastor Bob was really discouraged and he came up here and asked for something and instead of me just hugging him and loving him and saying nice things, if I said, Bob, you know what the word says. And if I pointed him back to the word and gave him the word, most people would criticize me for something like that. In a sense, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't come down to an emotional level, but he tried to bring John up to a faith level. And I'm telling you, most people, if you had two doors behind me tonight, and if one of them said feelings and the other one said the word, which would you rather have? I guarantee you most people would go for the door of the feelings every time. They say, I want to feel something. And I know some of you say, oh, not me. Well, let me bring it down to things. You know, I've been praying with some people this week about different things. And, you know, if you have a cancer or something, there are, this, this man, uh, Mike Hesh, I don't know how many of you have seen his testimony on our website, but he's the man that had a cancer that was on his chest that was as big as my two hands right here. It was huge. He had to get a bra and cut half of the bra out and wear it to hold this thing up. And he had it for eight years and he took pictures of it. And I mean, it was green and yellow with black tentacles that went all over his chest. It was terrible looking and it was oozing things. And I mean, he was close to death. He couldn't sit up. He couldn't hardly lift his hand. He was dying. And he got hold of the word, that teaching on you've already got it. And I mean, he got hold of the word and he says, I'm already healed. And he couldn't see a thing. He didn't feel any different. He didn't look any different. But on the inside, he had the word. He had this incorruptible seed. And he sowed it in his heart. And he began to just rejoice and praise God and tell his wife, Caroline, I'm healed. And man, it was hard on her because she still had to change the dressings every day. And this was still oozing all of this stuff. And it didn't look like he was healed. Caroline said it, it, she thought he had lost his mind, that it had affected his mind. But he just knew that he was healed and he didn't care what he felt like. He honestly said that he forgot it. There's some people I prayed with this week that haven't forgotten it. They're focused on it. 
and they aren't really going to believe. They aren't going to rejoice until they can see improvement, until they can feel improvement. I love you, but I'm telling you that what you're doing is you are looking for something physical, emotional, something that's tangible instead of just the Word of God. We've been talking about how the Word of God is the incorruptible seed and that you've got to take this seed and sow it in your heart. But the truth is most of us are carnal. Most of us are so dependent upon our feelings that there are people that you know that the Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know that the Bible says that, but you don't feel anything. And so you're discouraged and you're crying, oh God, would you please touch me? Oh God, would you please send your love this way? I have people all the time come and say, would you just pray that God would pour out his love? I feel like God has left me. Would you pray that God would do something? No, I won't <laughs> pray that. That's dishonoring God. You're sitting there saying, well, I know that the word says he'll never leave me, but I don't feel it. Would you please pray that I feel it? Pull your thumb out of your mouth. And just start going by what the Word says. Well, I, I don't care what the Word says. I feel it. People today, it, what you feel is more important than truth. I had a woman that came to our Bible college, and we have people give 10-minute talks. And anyway, she made this 10-minute talk, and she was talking about a friend of hers, this couple, that she, they were good friends, and she knew them. And they weren't perfect people, but they were good people. They loved God. And their daughter got an offense over something that wasn't, shouldn't have had an offense. It was wrong. She took an offense where none was intended. And anyway, because of it, she just hated her parents and thought her parents were terrible people. And this woman knew the parents and said the parents were not guilty of what this girl accused them of. She just misinterpreted it. She misunderstood it and she took an offense. And so anyway, this girl came to this woman and asked her for help. And this woman says, I knew that what she was feeling wasn't true, but it didn't matter if it was true. To her, it was true. And so she led her through forgiving her parents. And man, I got so mad. This was a cassette tape. I pulled it out of that thing and just ripped it apart and threw it out the window. I littered. <laughs> but man, it made me mad. Because that's the way people, well, it doesn't matter what reality is. I don't care whether it's true or not. This is what I feel. You have exalted feelings above truth and reality. And that's the reason that Satan is able to steal from you. People say, well, I know that God will never leave me, but I just don't feel his presence. Would you please pray for me that I'd feel his presence? No, quit being carnal. Amen. I can tell you all are really blessed by this. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. Man, so, well, I've got to eventually feel healed. Yeah, you do. Either that or you get to go be with Jesus, which isn't bad. I'm not saying that you ignore feelings and stuff, but we shouldn't be controlled, dominated, driven by them. I've prayed with people and every bit of their pain leaves. And I said, praise God, you're healed. I prayed with a woman this morning. I think it was. It might have been this afternoon. Anyway, I prayed with a woman either last night or this morning that had had pain for 25 years, standing right over there as I was leaving. I prayed with her. She had been in constant pain for 25 years. And before I even got through with my prayer, all of her pain was gone. And she was just jumping and shouting. She was excited. But I've prayed with people before that every bit of pain leaves them. And I say, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. And they say, all right, I'm going to go to the doctor and see if I'm healed. Man, if I was God, I'd just drop kick you off into space. <laughs> You're going to wait until you can get a piece of paper to prove it or until you can feel it instead of believing that by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. That if any two of you agree on earth touching it, it's done. And so you're going to wait until you feel something, until somebody can prove it to you before you believe it. You're carnal. Carnal doesn't mean you're bad. The word carnal means of the five senses. You are controlled by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. 
You are carnal. You're controlled by your natural things instead of by faith. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. But the truth is most Christians walk by sight and not by faith. We walk by feelings. God, I don't feel that you love me. Well, then your feelings are wrong. Amen. But I don't feel it. Well, your feelings are wrong because the Bible says that he loves you. You know, John wasn't feeling right. He, he was facing death and he was eventually executed. He was muzzled. He couldn't speak. There, there was things going wrong. He may have thought that the Christ was going to turn over the Roman government. And there, I don't, who knows all of the reasons why he felt like he felt. But instead of Jesus just saying, oh, John, you're awesome. John, you are the fulfillment of prophecy. John, there's never been a person born better than you. And saying all of these things, it might have been true, but it was emotional type stuff. Jesus said, go tell him what you've seen and heard. Tell him he'll be blessed if he believes and isn't offended. He referred him back to the word of God because that is the greatest way that God has of ministering to us. And yet most of us would take the word of God and we'd throw it on the ground if we could have some emotional high. That's wrong. And that's the reason that we're susceptible. Satan moves in this emotional realm. Did you know your emotions can be affected by a lot of things? I remember this lady who was a missionary to uh, Costa Rica and we went down there and she'd been seven days with no sleep and hadn't been eating and um, anyway, there were reasons for that. But when we got there, this woman just flipped out. This woman lost it. And I mean, some bad, bad things happened. Her emotions were affected because her body was... When you get tired, it makes you feel certain things. There's all kinds of things that can affect your feelings. Did you know you can put on one of these virtual reality helmets... And you can sit there and you could be sitting still. You could be strapped into a chair where you can't even move. And yet you could see yourself on a roller coaster or one of these things that spins around. And you can get motion sickness and get sick and throw up and you never moved. It's all between your ears. I'm telling you that there's a lot of things that happen. There's times that you don't feel like God loves you. Well, you're wrong but I want to feel it. Forget your feelings. And you know, the good news is that when you quit enthroning your feelings and you say, I'm going to live by the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Whatever God says about me is true. And I don't care what my circumstances say. I don't care what the banker says. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what the lawyer says. This is what God's word says about me. This is who I am. It's what I have. It's what I can do. And when you get to where you live like that, the strange thing is your emotions will be better <laughs> because you aren't enthroning them and making them God. You know, look at this passage of scripture over in Ephesians chapter four. This is a great truth here. I spent an entire year ministering on Ephesians chapter four. I tell you, it was awesome. Ephesians chapter four and verse 17. Therefore, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Gentiles here is referring to people that aren't born again, people that don't know the Lord. Don't walk like people that aren't born again, that don't have the Lord in the vanity of of your mind. What's the word vanity mean? The word vanity means inutility and intransientness is what that word means. Inutility means you just aren't using your brain. Your head's supposed to be for more than just a hat rack. Amen. You're supposed to use your brain. You're supposed to think. But there's people that just walk like the Gentiles. You don't use your brain. And then the transientness, that means that you aren't focused. A transient is a person that doesn't have a fixed location. They're just moving around all of the time. They don't have a fixed place. Your mind should be focused. This one thing I do is what 
Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. We used that this morning. You should be focused upon the Lord, not transient. So your mind should be fixed on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. If you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, you'll have perfect peace. If you don't have perfect peace, your mind is not stayed on the Lord. Period. End of story. Amen. And so he says, don't be like the Gentiles that don't use their brain. They aren't focused on things. In verse 18, having the understanding darkened. This word understanding is the Greek word dianoia, and it means deep thought, not just thoughts. There's some people that'll say, well, man, I've heard you, but I keep my mind on the Lord. Well, but they do it on a surface level. They don't get deep. They don't understand. This is talking about deep thought. And this same Greek word, dianoia, over in Luke chapter 1, I believe it's verse 51, was translated imagination. It's actually talking about your imagination. There are people that can quote, by his stripes we're healed. And they know what the word says. But in your imagination, you see yourself dying. The doctor says you're going to die and you see yourself dying. You're sitting here thinking about your funeral, wondering what it would be like. Your imagination wasn't affected. Just a surface level. You can quote the scripture, but it hasn't sunk down to where it's changing the way that you really see things. There's people that know that by, you know, that he will supply all of my need and they can quote the scriptures to you. But the truth is you have a poverty mentality. You're cheap. <laughs> and yet you're sitting there, why aren't I prospering? Because you're cheap. <laughs> Amen. You got to get beyond that. You got to get to where who cares what my body says, what my, my bank account says. This is what God's word says. And you got to get in, that down into your deep thoughts. So it says, having the understanding, if you don't use your mind and the truths of the Word of God properly, you will have your understanding, your deep thought darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Brothers and sisters, I say this in love, but there are people that are alienated, separated from the life-giving power of God because all you can do is go by how you feel, what the doctor says, what the lawyer says, what the banker says, and you honor that, and that has more control over you than what the Word of God says. That alienates you from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And then in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. The word lasciviousness means uncontrolled, unrestrained desire. So this is saying that once you quit using your brain and going by what you know true, but instead you're going to go by how you feel. You are going to have your understanding darkened and you're just going to be carnal and go by your feelings. You have gone past the normal use of feelings, the proper use of feelings. Feelings aren't of the devil. I'm not advocating being Spock to where you have no emotion. Emotions are wonderful, but emotions should be the caboose, not the engine. You shouldn't let it drive you. And, and again, when you get everything in line, when you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, you'll have perfect peace. And emotions actually are a great thing. Every once in a while, I begin to start having discouragement come against me, or I'll have just, you know, blandness come against me, or I'll just think, what am I doing? I have emotions like anybody else, but I've learned that when those emotions come, the word is true, not what I feel. And so if I'm not feeling the way that the word of God says I should, it's a sign to me that I'm not keeping my mind stayed upon God or I wouldn't have these emotions. Because if I keep my mind stayed upon the Lord, he'll keep me in perfect peace. If I don't have perfect peace, that is just a warning to me that I am not seeking the Lord the way I should. And so the moment I begin to feel anything less than perfect peace, man, I shut something off. I put my nose in the word. I go to praying in tongues and seeking the Lord. I don't ignore feelings. I have feelings. 
but I am not going to let feelings dictate and control my life. I use them as a warning system. And once you get your mind on the things of the Lord, well, then all of your emotions just follow along. So this is saying they've gone past feeling. What that means is they've gone past what God intended feelings to be. And they've gone into lasciviousness, uncontrolled, unrestrained desire. You are just passionate about all of these things that don't matter. You are going by how you feel and all of this stuff. And I'm telling you, that chokes the Word of God. And many times we indulge people's emotions. We actually are doing them a disservice, disservice the way we minister to them. You know, we had a situation where at one of our camp meetings, the youth were having a meeting and they were worshiping the Lord and, and a boy came up and said that last year, the year before, he was going to commit suicide. He had enough drugs in his pocket that he was going to commit suicide. And he came to that service as a last resort just to give God one more chance. And God spoke to him and he got healed and delivered. And he was just doing fine that year. So he gave that testimony and he says, I feel like there's somebody here who is facing suicide. And sure enough, there was a girl that had already decided she was going to kill herself. So she came up and she got prayer and she got delivered. And praise God, that's good. But when they told me about it and told me who this was, you know, they were saying, isn't that wonderful how Jesus just set you free and stuff. But when they told me who it was, I know this boy. I know his parents. His parents love him. His parents are some of the most godly parents. He had zero reason to be thinking of suicide. And, and very subtly, when we sit there and say, well, I know it's tough and I know that you feel like killing yourself and, and we just want to hug you and help you and God loves you. You know, sometimes what you need is a good swift kick in the rear. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? What have you got to feel like committing suicide over? Man, you're blessed, you're prospered, your parents love you and all of this. And I think sometimes what we need to do is tell people to pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. This is one reason we make our students go on a foreign missions trip before you can graduate from Karis Bible College because you think you got it bad. Well, I don't have any money and stuff. Did you know most of you that are struggling here are richer than, than most of the people in this world? You should go with me to some of the places I've been where people were born and raised and die on a garbage heap and never had anything more than a cardboard box to live in, have never had a toilet in their life, have struggled and have never been full in their life. You go see them and all of a sudden you'd feel a lot better about your situation. What I'm saying is once you start indulging your emotions and once you start saying, oh, but but I really feel bad. And you have to have an epiphany. God has to do something special. There has to be a bolt of lightning or something to get you encouraged. You've just set yourself up for failure because you will feel bad again sometime. And if the way you cope with it is to have God jump through some hoop and do something special for you instead of just taking the truth and, and standing on the truth, you are eventually going to reach a place where you won't you won't get your uh, needs met. It's like a dope addiction. You know, once you get high, you got to have a higher dose to get high the next time. And pretty soon you get to where you can't even get high anymore. You just run a course and it's destroying you. And the moment you start indulging your emotions and you have to pray and have a bolt of lightning, an awesome, awesome word from God, a voice from heaven to get you going, you are setting <coughs> yourself up for a fail, fa failure. This friend of mine, who I'm not going to tell you who it is, but he's a very well-known minister. You know who he is. You've probably heard him and read some of his books. I held a meeting with him, and I had just ministered on this, what I'm talking right here. And he was one of those that doesn't ever come and listen to anybody but himself. So he didn't hear my session. <laughs> and then he came up right after me and got to talking about how he's traveled the world. He's written all of these books. He's been on television. He's done everything. But he was in a place, and he was on the 13th floor of a hotel, and he was so discouraged 
and so sad that he actually stood on the balcony and considered throwing himself off and committing suicide and killing himself because he was just so dry. And he got to crying, talking about it. And he said, I just fell on my knees and said, oh God, I need a new touch. God, you've got to touch me. Oh God, do something. And he just cried out to God for hours. And eventually it's like the heavens open and God touched him. And he's saying, now I'm on top again. And man, I'm full of God. And he says, if you need a special touch from God, I want you to come down here and you just cry out until God touches you. And I just taught just the opposite, that it doesn't matter how you feel. Go by what God's Word says. And you know what? All but one guy in the thing, me, <laughs> went down front. And I understand God loves us and He'll meet us where we are. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that's the wrong way to deal with your discouragement and hurt is to just stay until all of a sudden you have some emotional experience God touches you because those things are few and far between. You can't get a handle on that. You can't make God just all of a sudden make you feel good. But you can stand on the Word of God that I have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance on the inside of me, and I don't care whether I feel it or not, I've got it. And I'm going to act like it. And you just start praising God by faith. There's a lot of people who say, well, I'm just trying to be real. You're being real carnal is what you're being, amen. You're just being real dominated by your emotions. I'm telling you, faith is going by what God's Word says regardless of what you say, regardless of what you feel, regardless of anything. And I'm just amazed at how many people cannot connect these dots and see this. They let their body dictate to them. They let their finances dictate to them. And I know a lot of people just think, man, you're weird. You know what I think. You're weird, amen. I think you're weird when we have all of this life of God and you are just going by what you see. Did you know right now there's radio signals, television signals in this room? And some of you say, oh no, there's not. Why not? Because you can't see them. You can't hear them. That doesn't mean they aren't here. It just means you aren't very smart. They're here. You know what? I don't have any uh, wires running from me, amen. And yet you can hear this mic because it's transmitting a signal back there through the air. You can't see it. You can't feel it, but it's there. And that's how they take this signal and put it up there. There's things going on that you can't perceive with your little peanut-sized brain. <laughs> Why in the world do we think that, man, if I can't feel it, it's not real? Man, you need to grow up. You can't see germs, but you've come to realize they're real and you learn to wash your hands and you learn to do certain things. I'm telling you, you got to get beyond. If you are all wrapped up in yourself and think unless you feel it, nothing has happened, you just make a very small package. You're all wrapped up in yourself. You make a small package. You need to realize that there's all kinds of things going on that you can't feel. Well, I just don't feel the anointing of God. Well, then you're wrong. Because the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus is here in all of his glory tonight. The power of the Holy Spirit is here. And if you don't feel it, it's more of an indication of your deadness than it is his vacancy. Amen. If somebody wants to come up here and say, man, I don't feel the presence of God, but I know he's here. I know the word says it. What's wrong with me? Would you pray with me? Yeah, I'll pray with that. I'll pray God, open up their eyes and help them to see the hope of his calling. I'll, that's what Ephesians 1 says. I'll pray that. But if you come up here saying, man, I don't feel God. God's forsaken me. Would you please pray that God would change and God would touch me? No, because you're implying that God's at fault. God is not at fault. God has never left you. God has never deserted you. If you feel deserted, you deserted Him. If it feels like God's a long ways off, guess who moved? It's not God. And all you got to do is just go back and put your mind on the Lord and things like this. I tell you, the Word of God is like an anchor 
The Word of God keeps you stable. It keeps you from drifting all of these places. I'm not going to tell you all of the things, but there's things happening in my life right now that could totally destroy me. I need $120 million quickly. We got things going. I got problems that make most of your problems look small. But you know what? I've learned that God's word is true. I've stood on it. I've seen God come through time. And I just do not sit here and worry about it. I have to have, I forget now, but $110 a minute, 24, 60 minutes out of every hour, 24 hours out of every day. Man, think about that. If you were to think about that, you could get plumb discouraged. But you know what? I look at the Word of God and I don't look at these other things. I don't sit here and anticipate. I don't always go by what's in my bank account. I tell you, what I'm sharing is profound. It would change your life. But it's very few people can embrace this. You know why? Because they don't meditate in the Word. And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And very few people let the Word of God get in the way of what they believe. This is what the doctor said. Oh, I know, but here's what Jesus said. Well, I know. All right, pray for me, and then I'll go to the doctor and see if Jesus came through. It's not how it works. Here's what Jesus said. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Well, man, I'm not blessed. I don't feel blessed. Well, then your feelings are wrong. Amen. I can't see any blessings in my life. That means you aren't co- cooperating with God. But God has already blessed you, and all you got to do is just get in tune, in step with God, and the blessing of God will begin to manifest. I tell you, it gives me stability in my life to know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if I'm walking with God, I'll be the same. If you're up and down like a yo-yo and sometimes you can shout and run with the best of them and then you can just cry and you're so low and depressed, you aren't walking in the Word of God. You are letting feelings dominate you. You have gone past feelings into lasciviousness. And man, Satan is just destroying you. You're alienated from the life of God. And you don't have to be that way. You can control your emotions or Jesus would have been wrong to say, let not your heart be troubled. He was talking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. You know, most people today, if something traumatic happened and if I said, don't let your heart be troubled, people would say, well, you are insensitive. You're supposed to feel what they feel. You're supposed to get down and you're supposed to show compassion and you're insensitive. Jesus Talk to his disciples. They were about to see him arrested and crucified. And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Most people, that's insensitive. Man, he was giving them the word of God. And he even goes on to say in that same message, John 16, 1, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They didn't have to be offended, but they were because they did let their heart be troubled. You'll have psychiatrists come up and say, You can't help it. You're in denial if you don't just fall apart like a $2 suitcase when tragedy happens. And that's because they're dealing with things only from a human perspective. But I'm telling you, I am not just human. There is one third of me that is wall to wall Holy Ghost. And I do not have to give in and feel about things the way people that don't know God do. Man, I'm going to walk in the Word. And I'm not a perfect example, but I have done this enough that I'm seeing it work. I I know it works. I've seen great things happen. I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen great miracles happen. And I'm telling you, I've seen enough that I know it works. Even when I don't work it properly, I know it works. It's not God who ever fails me. It's me that fails to walk in the Word of God. And I let what I see and what I feel dominate me. And any time I get out of whack in my feelings and emotions, I just bring it back to the Word of God and start standing on the Word of God. And I tell you, it's a great way to live. I would recommend it. 
And I'm saying this in love tonight, but brothers and sisters, I know God didn't have me say this to all the people that didn't come. This is for us. This is for you. I need it. And I've been walking in this for a long time, and yet I guarantee you, I, I preach myself happy. I preach myself into faith. You need this. You need to encourage yourself. And we need to turn from the way that this world thinks that just goes by their own carnal reasoning. They don't go by truth. They aren't standing on what the word says. They're just going by their feelings. You got to quit that. What does the word say about you? The word says that you are more than a conqueror. Is that what you say about you? Or do you let circumstances tell you I'm a loser? What's your self-talk like? You know, I have people in our school all of the time, and I have my staff. They'll tell me about something that's happening. And I say, well, I've talked to those people, and they've never done that to me. And they tell me all the time. They say, people don't tell you what they think because they know I'm going to say something about it. And all of the time they tell me, says, they don't tell you what they tell me. And so I have people around me that know how I feel. And when they're around me, yes, brother, I'm healed. Yes, brother, things are working. But how do you talk to yourself when you're by yourself? What's your self-talk like? Maybe you know what to say when you're in church, when you're around me or somebody. But what do you say to yourself? What do you say in the middle of the night when you're having pain? Do you sit there and indulge those thoughts and just go by how you feel and start thinking about your funeral? And am I going to be like this the rest of my life? That's what, that's the real you. You got to start controlling that. You can't just do it around the preacher. You got to get to where, man, you are dogmatic. And here's my last thing. I am going to quit, believe it or not. I could go for a long time, but here's my last thing. You need to get aggressive with this. You don't need to be passive. You don't need to say, dear devil, please leave me alone. You need to get angry. You need to get angry. God gave us a temper not to use against people, but to use against the devil. I used that verse this morning out of Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. A scripture that goes along with that is Romans 12, verse 9, that says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. God gave you a capacity for anger. It is not supposed to be used against people. We are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. You aren't supposed to be mad at people. You should be mad at the devil. You need to get mad at sickness. You need to get mad at poverty. You need to get mad at unforgiveness. You need to get mad at the devil and tell him where to go and give him directions how to get there. Amen. You need to get upset. You need to quit tolerating things. Man, get mad at your carnality saying, I refuse to stay this way. I refuse to be an emotional wreck. I refuse to let what people say about me control me. I'm going to let what Jesus says about me control me. You need to get aggressive. You know, if you were to read this exact same story in Matthew chapter 11, it's the same story of John the Baptist. Let me just read this verse and I'll quit. Promise. Honest. Maybe. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, it's the same story about John the Baptist. And right after he said that there's um, none greater than John the Baptist, he said this in verse 11. Matthew 11, 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What's that talking about? It's talking about people that have this attitude that I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what anything. Here's what the Word of God says, and I am not going to compromise. And Satan, you had better not come at me because I am going to hit you with the Word of God. And you get mad at the devil and let him have it. And tell it. You got to get violent and say, I am not going to put up with poverty, depression, discouragement, and sickness. I refuse to be this way. Get mad. 
I couldn't tell you how many times Satan has just piled on me and I try and take it patiently and continue to worship the Lord. And finally, you just hit a breaking point to where, man, I can't stand it anymore. And I get mad. Satan, I command you to get off of me. And all of a sudden, boom, there's a breakthrough. And I wonder, why did I wait so long <laughs> to do that? I remember when we were building our first building out there and the, the neighbors next door, anyway, long story, but they wouldn't uh, release the rights to us. We, we waited two years trying to get approval to build that building. And finally, I had been confessing and saying in the name of Jesus, we got favor and everything. And finally, one day as I was driving through, I just got mad. And I said, this is it. This is two years. It's long enough. And I said, Satan, you get out of my way. This person that is hindering me, he has to get out of my way or he is going to get run over. And I got mad and I, I just cursed them, not with profanity, but in the name of the Lord. I said, you are out of my way. God's going to remove you one way or the other. Did you know one of the people that was fighting me was the mayor? And guess what happened? came out, he was a pedophile and he got kicked out of office and the mayor that's in office is a good friend. He just thinks we're great. <laughs> and things begin to work. And you know what? All of a sudden everything worked and I thought, why did it take me two years? I should have done this two years ago. <laughs> Amen. You got to get violent. The violent take the kingdom by force. I've told this to people and I had one woman say, but I'm just not that type of a person. I'm just a sweet person. And I said, even to the devil. And they said, yes. <laughs> and I said, you're going to die. And they did. They died because they couldn't get mad at the devil. They couldn't stand. They were passive. They were nice even to the devil and they died. You know what? They went to be with the Lord. They were born again. So it's not like they totally lost. But I'm telling you, if you want to see kingdom come here on this earth, you're going to have to take the word of God, overcome your emotions, get violent with it, and you tell your emotions to straighten up. Man, if you get butterflies, you know, I used to be afraid to stand up here and minister. I was an introvert and I couldn't talk in front of people. Now you can't shut me up. But you know what? I used to have butterflies when I'd get up and I'd just begin to take authority over them and command them to all fly in formation. Amen. <laughs> I don't deny that I have feelings and emotions, but I'm going to take control of them. Amen. I'm going to make them do what I want them to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's everybody stand up. Amen. If you stand up, maybe I'll quit. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you that you have given us something that is going to last longer than heaven and earth. Your word will never pass away. Thank you that it is the power of God. And Father, I just pray that you take the things that I've talked about tonight and that this would be transferred into people. That Father, we would get such a confidence in the word of God that we would start going by what the word says and not by what we feel and not what somebody else says that the Word of God would dominate us. Father, I just speak these things and I believe that people's hearts are open to receive it. And that, Father, this is going to set people free. The truth we know sets people free. And I pray that you speak to people who have been dominated by their emotions, that have gone beyond feeling and have gone into lasciviousness to where they're just dominated and controlled by what their body feels, by what their emotions feel. Thank you, Jesus. I've shared the truth, and I believe that this truth is setting people free if they receive it. So we just receive it right now. Satan, we take a stand against you. For those whose faith has been quickened and that they're now in agreement with me, we take a stand against you. And we command the depression, yes. the discouragement, yes. the fear, the worry, the anxiety. We just speak against you. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what the circumstances say. God's word says we are overcomers. That we are more than overcomers. 
Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. We just speak forth our faith and we say, body, you get in line. Circumstances, you get in line. Sickness and disease, you leave. Body, you respond. Pain, you be gone. Tumors, you shrink. Cancers, you leave us now in the mighty name of Jesus.